My name is John Demos. I am the author of Getting Started with Neurofeedback and the Clinical Director of Neurofeedback of Southern Vermont. Our organization represents the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. This presentation is a review of module number two of the BCIA's curriculum, Getting Started with Neurofeedback. Module number two consists of basic neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. It covers topics such as key functions of lobes and the limbic system. It answers such questions as how does the brain generate the EEG and provides us with a brief history of biofeedback. If we consider the brain and its functions according to lobes, we can see here are the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, the parietal lobes, the occipital lobes, as well as the sensory motor cortex. This is the motor portion, portion, that's the sensory portion. And here we have the cerebellum, which is responsible in part for our balance. The executive cortex, or the frontal lobes, especially the prefrontal cortex, helps us make decisions and plan for the future. The sensory motor cortex assists us in fine motor skills. The parietal lobes assist us in perceptions, making sense of the world, arithmetic, spelling, complex grammar. The visual cortex helps us to process visual information. Here we see an expanded view of the sensory motor cortex. Training in these areas often results in improved handwriting. Here we see the cingulate gyri. These, this dual structure helps us to be flexible. Problems with this structure leads to problems with flexibility, such as worrying and obsessions or children have temper tantrums when they're asked to stop what they're doing and perform a different task. The frontal lobes include the motor strip. Damage to them can lead to increased risk-taking, depression, changes in social behavior. The temporal lobes are often assisting us in making permanent memories along with the hippocampus, which is a deeper brain structure. Damage to the temporal lobes often occurs when there is traumatic brain injury, such as a car accident. EEG slowing, such as delta and theta, occurs. Bursts of rhythmic temporal theta often occur when there is age-related cognitive decline. The parietal lobes help us to make sense of our body in space. They assist us in complex pattern recognition. And when the parietal lobes are operating poorly, there may be difficulties with writing, difficulties with math, and spelling. The occipital lobes help us to recognize simple shapes. Damage can lead to deficits in uh, our visual uh, acuity. We might see hallucinations or have illusions. The thalamus is the most important deep brain structure when it comes to generating the EEG rhythm. All incoming sensory data are processed by the thalamus except for the sense of smell. The thalamus is a relay station. The thalam thalamic nuclei orchestrate the hubs or modular networks of the brain. Here we see an example of the five hubs or modular networks of the brain. The motatory auditory circuit, the visual circuit, attention circuit, default circuit, and the limbic circuit or hub. How can we use hub or modular technology with live z-score training and neurofeedback. Once we identify the hub or module that most likely contributes to our client's distress, we know where to put our electrodes. Hub sites and actions are clearly shown in the mini DC assessment software package. Let's consider um, a test. What if we were to match symptoms to neurology? If you had an adolescent that you were treating who had poor penmanship, why you'd expect poorly functioning sensory motor circuit or cortex. An adult who has a severe car accident expects slowing in the temporal lobes. An adult who can't stop worrying about problems expect beta in the posterior cingulate gyrus. A teenager who has difficulty with complex grammar expect difficulties in the left angular gyrus, which is in the parietal lobes. 
And what about the client who has poor judgment? Well, then there are likely problems in the frontal lobes. Now let's consider some of the basics of neurophysiology and electrophysiology. Here we have a neuron. There is the body or the cell of the neuron. There are the dendrites, so the branches that pick up incoming information or excitation. There we have the axon that is covered by the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath regulates the speed of transmission. And once a charge begins, and goes down the axon in an all-or-nothing fashion. If it if it is con goes all the way to the end, then a neurotransmitter is ejected from the axon terminal buttons into the synapse, and it excites or inhibits an adjacent neuron. When there is injury to the head, there could be changes in cerebral white matter damage or gray matter damage. White matter damage corresponds to increased delta. Gray matter damage corresponds to decreases in power. Brain waves are formed by a dual action. A cycle starts when the terminal button releases the neurotransmitter in order to excite the adjacent neuron. An excited cell may also have inhibitory effects on neighboring cells. Brain waves are a measurement of excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Alpha blocking relates to pyramidal cells that synchronize when the eyes are shut. This results in higher amplitudes of alpha. In effect, alpha is deactivated. Alpha is correctly called an idling rhythm. When the visual circuit idles, then the amplitude of alpha goes up. When eyes are open, alpha activates and the amplitude drops. Regional cerebral blood flow no brainwave activity could occur unless the brain was supplied with enough oxygen and glucose. Inadequate regional cerebral blood flow corresponds to EEG slowing, that is higher amplitudes of theta or high theta to beta ratios. Now let's have a brief history of neurofeedback. When we start a history of neurofeedback, we're thinking first of Hans Berger. In the 1920s, he was the first one to measure the EEG on the closed human scalp. He was the first one to create the electroencephalogram, that is the raw EEG on paper. Berger rhythm, or 10 Hertz, was discovered by Hans Berger. He recognized that 10 Hertz is the dominant rhythm of the adult brain and that alpha was the discrete morphology that is best seen with eyes closed. He also named other brainwave morphologies such as delta and beta. Joe Camilla, in 1963, was basically the father of biofeedback. He recognized the three-step process. An instrument records a specific biological activity. A trainee is reinforced each time the activity occurs, and then voluntary regulation of a biological activity becomes possible. Barry Sturman, in 1967, published his landmark experiment with cats. And he determined that cats who were trained to increase sensory motor rhythm were, became more seizure resistant than those who did not. Finally, we have Joel Lubar, who discovered that excessive theta activity and a lack of beta was one of the primary neurological landmarks of attention deficit disorder. High theta to beta ratios make up almost half of those with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. If we look at the color plate 617C in the book Getting Started with Neurofeedback, we will see all four signatures in the EEG that relate to ADHD. A signature is a discrete pattern of the EEG that can easily be identified. Peniston and Kokoski, their landmark study was approximately in 1990 and they did alpha theta training with veterans of the Vietnam arena and they helped to alleviate the symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder and chronic alcoholism. So module number two helped us to appreciate basic neurophysiology and neuroanatomy, the functions of lobes, the generating of the EEG, and a brief history of biofeedback. Module number three is next, instrumentation and electronics.